Good evening everyone. On behalf of the Root and Branch here at the Israel Center, the OU Israel Center here in Jerusalem, it gives us great pleasure to introduce a very special guest, David Herman. Um, and tonight's topic is going to be the secret world of Israel's singing novelist. So we're going to hear insights into David's passion for singing and passion for writing. And um, on behalf of Lowell Gallen, who's the founder of the Root and Branch, who couldn't be here this evening, but sends his fondest regards, uh, I want to thank you all for coming out this evening. And we look forward to a fascinating evening um, in anticipation to your wonderful music and the history, what inspired you, both in your writing, your compositions. And we look forward to a lovely evening of hearing your music and your passion, what made you decide to move in this direction. Uh, David is a graduate of Cambridge uh, and he came to Israel in 66 and has been involved in the literary scene here in, in Israel for many years. Um, the author of two very uh, prominent books, which you can see here, the uh, bestseller about the Jerusalem, book fair. the Jerusalem Book Fair, The Golden Eggs of Sacramentes. So, and also David was very instrumental in this wonderful Sabraman uh, comic strip which was very successful and also in an English newspaper that went to different schools that encouraged the children to, to improve their English. And David will tell us more and elaborate more on these wonderful projects that you did. Not only projects, but these ideas that came to fruition. Anyway, we really look forward to your evening, to your delivery. And we thank you very much for being here. Without further ado, David, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Les. Thank you. <coughs> well, we haven't got snow yet, but we're going to try and break the ice before I begin. So I'm going to get, have you sing with me a couple of little songs to break the ice. Where is the ice? No ice cream either? He got the whole world in his hand. He got the whole wide world in his hand. He got the whole world in his hand. He got the whole world in his hand. Aulam kulo be de Hashem. Aulam kulo be de Hashem. In his hand he got Larry and Les and they In his hand he got my old good friend from England In his hand, in his hand How long could I be day Hashem? How long could I be day Hashem? How long could I be day Hashem? How long could I be a Israel Kula, the Kodesh Tov Le Kula, be Hashem. And let's sing together before we begin the talk. Yerushalayim Shel Zahar, Avir Harim Salul Kayayin, Vareyachorani. Shall <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Thanks for the applause. Wow. Thanks for the applause. Okay. This evening, I'm going to talk a lot about myself, about my, new, my book, my beautiful book, 
which, ladies and gentlemen, no doubt about it, this is a linguistic masterpiece. You, you're, you're smiling there, uh, Adrian. Is it Adrian? What's the Hebrew name now? Abraham. Eh? Abraham. Abraham. And Larry is also smiling there. Uh, this is yet a new, a new departure. This is my second novel, actually, because the first one was bestseller, which I wrote some 20 years ago <coughs> and presented to President Herzog when he came to my stand at the uh, Jerusalem Book Fair. And this is based on my 20 years experience as a publisher in Israel, which I began with your colleague, Rafi Dobrin, and we got together and for 20 years we produced newspapers for the, for the school system in simple, simplified English with glossaries and stories from all over the world. And we reached basically thousands and thousands of pupils who all today, yes, no doubt about it, speak perfect English. And later on, I will sing my anthem for the English teachers here, but not yet. So I began life, as I told you, Les, uh, in England. I was born during the Blitz. And that, when the doodlebugs came over, you, you remember that. You were there at the same time, right? I think we lived in the same neighborhood almost. Where, where was your, uh, your, your, your home, home? We lived in Chelsea. Where? Chelsea. Chelsea. Chelsea, no, long before Chelsea. Chelsea appears here, by the way. The Chelsea Synagogue is in this book. Oh. Yes, I thought you'd know. I didn't have time to put your name in, though, Abraham. So there it was, born in the Blitz. My parents, my mother came from Poland. Uh, she came, my father met her in Poland in 1938 on a visit to see what was happening to the Jewish people in Poland. And there, at a, at a resort town, Krynice, I think it was, he came across my mother, and they fell in love. And he brought her over six months later to England, and they married. And thank God I am here as a result of that marriage. Because the rest of her family, sadly, did not survive the Holocaust, or very few of them at least. And my mother <coughs> came from a family descended from the famous rabbi, the Rema. And the Rema had descendants who came to my, who, who were, at least my mother, had a great grandfather called Rav Dov Berish Meisels, maybe a name you may have heard of who was the chief rabbi of Krakow and later of Warsaw and a great Polish patriot at the same time. He even sat in the Polish Sejm and said, we Jews, we, we vote with our left hands because we have no rights. That was a famous saying of his. And he was offered the chief rabbinate of England, but he was too busy looking after his flocks and 50,000 people came to his funeral when he passed away in 1870. So maybe, I don't know, maybe I get something from him or from the Rema on my, on my mother's side. My father was a big Zionist and he was, by, uh, he was an accountant by uh, profession, a chartered accountant. And so I grew up, my brother lives in Carnet Chomron today and he couldn't be here because it's too much travel, but he sent best wishes to me and to everybody here. And it's a, it's a, it's a pleasure to speak here, uh, and we wish uh, Lowell all the very best. So <clears throat> that is one thing I wanted to mention. Now, in Cambridge, where I was fortunate enough, actually, I want to go back further. I, my parents thought I was going to be a diplomat, Larry. You don't. You understand what they what they were after, right? But so they said we must find a school which is suitable to bring up a diplomat. And what did they do? They searched around London and they came across a place called South Kensington, 
And in South Kensington, there was, ladies and gentlemen, a French lycée where you learn, if, where you must learn French at least. So that's the start of a diplomatic career, which I have tried to follow, but not so successfully as you, as you probably know. So I was at Le French lycée, I mastered French and Spanish, and I went on to Cambridge where I did modern languages, French, Spanish. And then in Cambridge, I was the chairman of the Israel Society, which helped me with my Zionist aspirations. And all the while, at the back of my head was the thought, maybe one day I could be a famous poet like, uh, who are the famous poets? Can you give me a name, famous, famous poet? Longfellow. Who? Longfellow. Longfellow, yes, that's a good one. Yeah, like Longfellow. Pushkin. Pushkin. <laughs> Bialik. Bialik. Now, there's a familiar name. I've heard that before. Uh, or even somebody to rival the great Arab writer, Sheikh Sapir. Uh, he wasn't Arab? No. I'm talking about Shakespeare. I mustn't speak badly about him. But he wrote a book about the Jewish people called, what was the book called? Merchant of Venice. What? The Merchant of Venice, right. And uh, I had dreams one day of perhaps rivaling him, but how could I, a humble Jewish guy from uh, Wilsdon and Chelsea, what right did I have to compare myself with the one and only Bill Shakespeare, uh, William Shakespeare? So, so I had to resort to writing little novels and for 20 years when I was a, uh, this is based on my experience as a publisher, this book. So I wrote it to publicize the Jerusalem Book Fair and it's a, a very humorous account of the Jerusalem Book Fair about a publisher who has only six weeks to write a bestseller and he manages to do so. And this is the result, this beautiful, the, these drawings here on the front and the design was by my dear friend and who is no longer with us, Ber Bernie Berniker, who was a uh, craftsman, a, 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 what do you call him? A, 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 he, he worked for the Jerusalem Post for many years and he passed away sadly young, too young. So, then, after that, I suddenly had this idea of writing about the legends. You know the legends of the golden eggs, produced by geese. But it occurred to me, what if the true story of golden eggs was about a human being who produced golden eggs? Why is it so strange to think of such a thing? It is not. And that is why this book, you see the golden egg which he produced? Here it is, one of them. Everybody can see it on the cover. And this is a guy called Cedric Bates. Notice the name, Cedric Bates. And he lives in London. He's very poor, he's ugly, he's, de he's almost destitute. And his parents called him Cedric because they had great hopes for him. Cedric is a very noble name in England. Cedric, it's a very unusually noble name. So they called him Cedric, or Ced for short. And then, one day, it happened. This seemingly destitute, poorly dressed, kind of a, you know, a, a no good, he goes to the toilet and suddenly he hears this sound which I describe in my book. He hears a triple clang in the toilet bowl and the chapter is called From Bowels to Bowl. Alarmed by the triple clang, Cedric stood up unsteadily and peered disbelievingly into the turgid waters of the toilet bowl. There, glinting in the base of the bowl, he made out three large, perfectly oval eggs that seemed to Cedric's bemused gaze 
to be painted gold. After several seconds of trepidation, he mustered up the courage to bend over and reach gingerly into the bowl to raise the strange objects to the surface. <clears throat> to his touch, they felt metallic and crumblingly solid of some considerable weight as he drew them one by one from the bowl, placed them by his feet. Out of the water they appeared even more golden and impressive. Where could they have come from? Shooting into the bowl from some invisible source? Cedric scanned the toilet urgently for a possible avenue of entry, but could see none. In the end, until finally an impossible, implausible possibility. But no, such things don't happen in real life. And yet, could it be, he wondered in growing alarm, that they had, the objects lying at his feet, had actually emanated from himself, had been emitted by his, Cedric's, own very own bowels. Had he perhaps unwittingly ingested them in the course of his supper? Had they perhaps slipped unseen into the sausage, or been camouflaged by the potato salad, or been embedded in the vanilla ice cream dessert? But surely he would have noticed three such large alien bodies, and they would surely have lodged in his throat, causing pain, discomfort, or choking. Finally, in the absence of any other horrifying thought, the truth dawned on him. He, Cedric Bates, an otherwise very ordinary Englishman, had effectively done what no human being had ever done before. In the whole of recorded human history, he had laid golden eggs, not one, but three, and three might come, and what might be termed a triumph in a moment of linguistic frivolity which this most definitely was not. And yet he realizes that despite the agony of producing such golden eggs, there was perhaps a silver lining in these golden eggs. And he goes on to find an expert. And who is the expert? It's his friend, the jeweler, Elmer Gold, who happens to be Jewish by, uh, you know, by name, etc., etc. Elmer Gold, and he goes to visit him with his hold all, and he sees what if these are just an illusion, or if they had any real value. And a furtive figure, capped, scarved, in dark spectacles, clutching a suspicious-looking hold all could be seen walking rapidly, clearly hoping to avoid unwelcome attention. And you will certainly guess what was in that hold all. Yes, by now, six, his precious cargo was still intact, six beautiful golden eggs. Now, when he came into the shop, Elmer Gold was a little taken aback by his client's furtive and enigmatic appearance, and Cedric's nervousness did little to dispel his initial apprehension. He thought of reaching for the alarm bell. However, once Ed Cedric had removed his hat and muffler and the sinister spectacles, Elmer recognized in Cedric an old schoolmate who was most unlikely to have had to turn in uh, to a gangster or a jewel thief. And Cedric says to Elmer, uh, Elmer, he says, I need your advice. Cedric, for old time's sake, I'll be happy to give you if I can. You see, Elmer, I have a problem. Ah, thought Elmer, here it comes. The request for a loan, just as I thought. It's like this, continued Cedric, heaving the hold all onto the counter. I need advice about these. And placing the eggs on the counter before the jeweler's astounded gaze. For a few seconds, Elmer stood like one transfixed, as one might say in archaic, poetic language, hypnotized into immobile speechlessness by the beauty and sensuous perfection of the eggs. Then, with a hint of suspicion in his voice, he asked, 
Where did you get these, Cedric? His mind was working furiously. How did a poor, semi-literate, semi shabbily dressed ex-classmate come into possession of three such unique, exquisite objects? So Elma, uh, Cedric tells him a story. It's like this, Elma. My dear Aunt Caroline in Australia, she passed away sadly a few months ago and left me these in her will because I was her favorite nephew and she had no one else to leave them to and she didn't want to chuck them out. I want you to tell me, Elma, if these are real gold or some cheap imitation for insurance purposes, you see. Well then, let's take a look, shall we? And Elma eagerly picked up one of the eggs and proceeded to give it the Elma Gold Test, may based on many years' experience of sorting out the genuine from the fake, a test which consisted of licking, smelling, feeling, and repeating this procedure several times with each egg in turn. Cedric, meanwhile, watched all this strange ritual in awed and anxious fascination. The moment of truth was fast approaching. Ah, said Elmer. He laid the eggs carefully and caressingly back on the counter. Four berger eggs, Cedric, dear chap. Four berger eggs. I knew it, thought Cedric. I'm a laughing stock in his eyes. They're worthless lumps of metal. What did you say? False? They're worthless? Worthless? Shame on you, Cedric. Worthless indeed. Why, these are pure Fauberger eggs, made by the world's greatest gold craftsman, Sébastien Fauberger. I'd stake my life on it, Cedric Bates. You are a very fortunate man to have such a loving and wonderful aunt, even if she was Australian. They're the finest Faubergers I've seen in years, worth a fortune. They have the scent, the taste, the feel, the shape of the finest Faubergers. And then Elma advises him to do what is the most necessary. Take these golden eggs to Northabys. I didn't say Sotheby's, I said Northabys. And put them on auction. And this is the next step in the novel. And what happens there is quite an amazing thing. Now, in the meantime, Cedric gets fired from his job and from his bank. They don't like his bank situation, his financial situation. But he's not too worried because he has the feeling something is going to happen because of the gold, of the gold eggs. So I just want to carry on and read with you what happens at North Abyss, because and, and these are only samples, he says, because he speaks to Mr. Fred Da Vinci, who's the uh, expert on Faberger eggs. Faberger, I didn't say Faberger. You get the you get the joke. Faberger means, and Faberger is the real thing. But never mind. These are Faberger, real Faberger. Extraordinaire! Extraordinaire! exclaims Fred da Vinci, reverting to Franglish. Such was his excitement. Such a moving story. Such romantica. Such dramatica. And now, Monsieur Bates, let us get down to the nitty gritty. How many eggs do you want to put up for auction? Well, let me see. I suppose at this stage I could manage ten said Cedric, feeling that perhaps such a number might be excessive. Ten, maravilloso, they'll be the highlight of next week's rare jewels and gold auction, and the sensationally romantic background to your, their presence will arise wide interest. You are a hero, Monsieur Bates, a true hero of the arts and human culture. And now we come to the chapter called Sudden Wealth, which was what happens, what happens there at Northerby's auction. And this is one of the highlights, of course, for Cedric. And now, 
my lords, ladies and gentlemen, and other titled and untitled folk, I have the honor to present the next item in your catalogue, the magnificent Fauberger egg collection. Ten superb golden eggs, crafted with sublime skill by the great imperial court goldsmith Sebastian Etienne Fauberger at the Tsar's bequest, and given as a farewell gift to a remarkably beautiful Australian lady, Anne Caroline, as a token of his undying passion, and today generously offered for auction by a family member. Now, what am I bid for this fabulous Fauberger egg collection? We shall start the bidding at 500,000. At once there was uproar in the room. A forest of hands shot up as people clamored to bid for the unique collection, and only Cedric remained in frozen immobility. Meanwhile, Benedict, the uh, man who was leading the bidding, was working himself and the crowd up. 600,000 I am bid by the gentleman over there. 700,000 by the lady in the mink coat. 800,000 by the Sultan of Foot. 900,000 by Lord Egham. One, two, two million, two hundred thousand. And finally the bidding reached a tremendous height when only two people remained to bid. At five million, the Earl of Chelsea decided to throw in the towel, deeming it wiser to invest the residual family fortune in diamonds rather than gold. This left two rivals in the field. A fresh volley of bidding took the price up to 7.4 million pounds, of which the Sultan acknowledged defeat, since even oil wealth has its limits, and better to invest the money in upgrading his harem or in the welfare of his subjects. Going, going, gone to Mr. Bill Freudenbacher VI from the United States for 7.4 million, pronounced a horse, sweat engulfed Benedict, bringing his suffering gavel dang crashing down and the curtain down on this unprecedented auction room drama. Fred da Vinci leapt to his feet, shouting and cheering wildly as his favorite rugby team had scored a try at Wickenham, then turned to embrace the anonymous hero of the hour. Cedric had fainted on hearing the fabulous sum. Sometime later, when he came to, he found Fred standing over him with a paper, beautifully decorated paper, on which was written, pay to Cedric L. Bates the sum of 1,820,000 pounds sterling and then in bold figures the enormous, blear leaf defying sum of 1,820,000. Despite his congenitally poor grasp of mathematics, Cedric was indignant. But Fred, you told me the winning bid was 7,400,000. There must be some mistake. Indeed it was, dear Mr. Bates. But as you surely are aware, nor the biz take a fully deserved 50% commission. That is half of 7,400,000, which is of course 3,200,000, out of which I, Fred Da Vinci, take my humble 30% commission, which leaves you precisely with the princely sum of 1,820,000 pounds, as is clearly writ on your check. And that is how, from a humble beginning, with three golden eggs in the toilet bowl, he suddenly becomes a very wealthy young man. And this causes him, ladies and gentlemen, to change his appearance to such an... To, he goes to the, to the barber to have his hair shorn. He goes to the tailor to have the smartest possible suits. He goes to the dental specialist to have his teeth seen to. And he turns out to be completely unrecognizable even to his dear parents, Sam and Martha, when he comes to visit them. Yes, true. And then they tell him that now that he has bought a house in Chelsea, a very fine apartment where he, he and his cat live happily now. 
And then one day, another secret. He has not told anybody what happened to him. No, it's a secret, like uh, the secret world of singing, uh, etc. It's a secret. Nobody should know that from his bowels have come three fantastic, right, Les? Three fabulous, light, right, Les? Three fabulous golden eggs. So then there is a moment in the book when another, se another secret changes his life altogether. So he's had one change from the money to change his appearance. And now comes another one when he's changed to something quite unexpected. And this is when he has a visit from his dear parents. His dear parents visit him in his new house in Chelsea. And and they tell him something which is quite unexpected. No need to apologize, said. We're, we're so proud of you. We just couldn't wait for an official. They come without an invitation to his new home. So we decided to surprise you. I hope you're not angry, because we disturbed you. Angry? How can I be angry with you? I owe you both so much. You were so patient, so loving, always believing in me. And now at last I can make it up to you. Angry never. It was at this point that Cedric noted that his parents were not entirely at their ease, now and again exchanging glances amid all the banter. Cedric put this down initially to their being unaccustomed to being in such fine surroundings. Could it be they were having difficulty in finding a suitable new apartment and that they needed above? I should mention that he gave them 200,000 as a gift for Sam's birthday, 68th birthday. Whatever the reason, returning to the sitting room for further refreshment, their palpable state, sense of unease communicated itself to Cedric. You, you seem a bit worried, Dad, said Cedric. No, said, nothing like that. We're still looking. It's just that, son, we wanted to tell you something. We just felt we had to tell you. Now that you're settled and in a much better situation, you see, said, said, Cedric, said Sam, summoning up all his courage. It's time you knew. Son, we're Jewish. Jewish? Cedric reeled back in the plush armchair in shock. Jewish? The strange sounding word ricocheted interminably from one end of his mind to the other. Did you say a Jewish dad? Yes, said. That's what I said. I'm sorry. Amid the welter of emotions which the word and sudden revelation evoked, Cedric knew that the old Cedric had never displayed any interest in any religion. Had taken it for granted his parents were good Christians which to all intents and purposes they were. As far as he could see, they didn't look Jewish at all. They didn't act Jewish. True, mother was a pretty good cook, and Cedric was aware of the Jewish penchant for good cooking. But that alone didn't make them Jewish. He realized that all that he knew about Jews was that they played a prominent part in the Bible and in writing musicals like, what was it called? Fidelio on the Roof or some such name. As far as he knew, he had never met any Jews in his old life, although, come to think of it, Elmer the Gold, the jeweler, jeweler who played such a significant role in identifying the eggs, could well be Jewish. But Sam and Martha, how on earth? Okay, he knew that Sam was short for Samuel, and Samuel was a prominent Old Testament prophet. But being called Sam didn't automatically mean that someone was Jewish. Why? There were millions of Sams, including Uncle Sam, who could never be suspected of being Jewish. 
But now here they were telling their 43-year-old after all these years that they were Jews. Cedric gazed at his beloved parents with new eyes. But mum and dad, why? Why didn't we tell you all these years till now? Is that what you're thinking, said Sam gently and apologetically, as if confessing to some shameful transgression. We just couldn't bring ourselves to tell you the truth all those years because of the sad state you were in and also because we didn't have the courage to reveal our secret to you or anyone. But Dad, why now after all these years? Your dad and I decided that now you had changed your life in so many good ways, we had to tell you the truth. I see, said Cedric, not really seeing how or why his parents had kept such a secret from him for so long. But I don't understand why you had to keep being his Jewish secret here in England, where, as far as I know, Jews are free to live and worship as Jews without any problems. Isn't that what makes Britain great? The freedom to believe and worship any way you want? Yes, said. Now we know that's true. But back then we lived in fear. In fear of what? The Inquisition, said. In Portugal. The Inquisition, exclaimed Cedric. What on earth is that? And what, for heaven's sake, has Portugal got to do with it? For hundreds of years, the Inquisition in Spain and Portugal persecuted Jews, remained true to their faith or kept their religion in secret. If they were caught and refused to become Christians, they were tortured and burnt on the auto da fe, or the stake. But if you were in her in Britain, what did you have to fear? You see, son, Martha and I were both born in Portugal in a little village called Sacramontes, where almost everyone was of Jewish origin, but outwardly Catholics. We all attended church and went to mass, but in secret we said some dimly re remembered Hebrew prayers, lit candles on the Sabbath, and avoided eating pork and other non-kosher food. We all kept the secret for fear of the Inquisition, we didn't know that it had long been abolished, and later when we fled to England, we kept our secret in case the long arm of the Inquisition would find us. So here in England we clung to our secret, to all intents and purposes acting like good, loyal Christians, but still Jews in our hearts. But what about the name? Bates! That's a very good, solid English name, said Cedric. Our family name said was, is, Oivos de Oro, a very old and honorable Jewish family name on the Iberian Peninsula. It means simply golden eggs. But here in Britain, we are happy with Bates. It's all behind us now. We can never go back to Port Portugal. This is our home now. But said, dear, dear boy, you mustn't let it bother you feel perfectly free to remain a Christian. We wouldn't expect you at this late stage to explore your Jewish roots. It's sometimes hard to be a good Christian, but from bitter experience, son, we can assure you it's much harder in this world at least to be a Jew, good or bad. And that is the great secret which changes his life forever. And then he goes back to Elmer and tells him, Elmer, he reveals the secret. Elmer doesn't understand or believe you. Good morning, Elmer. Tell me what is this? The little jeweler had staggered in amazement. He didn't recognize Cedric because all that he had done to change his appearance. And then, ah, just as I thought, said Cedric. To Elmer, you are Jewish. Yes, indeed, and have been since my birth and circumcision, said Elmer, hurriedly reaching for his skull pack, kippah, which he proceeded to place on his hairless scalp, as if to prove, beyond a shadow of doubt, that he was the real McCoy, so to speak, that rare specimen of humanity, the true Jew. The truth is, Elmer, the truth is that I am also now a Jew, said Cedric. Again, Elmer staggered. My dear fellow, said Elmer with genuine sympathy, what made you do it? Do you know what it means to be a Jew in the 21st century? It's not always a lot of fun, you know. 
the truth, Elmer, whether I like it is not, I am Jewish, but I haven't the foggiest idea what it means to be a Jew. You're the only person I know who can enlighten me on the subject. And in fact, in the, in the next, uh, in the next uh, movement, uh, the next part of the book, Elmer does tell him in brief what it means to be a Jew. So this means that he starts a new chapter in his existence, in his life. So there you have the opening of the book with the secret of the, of the man and his eggs and the secret of his parents and the name Uvos de Oro. So what does he do? First of all, he goes with Elmer to the synagogue. They have a Shabbos meal together. He sees the synagogue for the first time. He meets the rabbi. And all this is based very basically on my, my knowledge of Chelsea Synagogue. I try and, and he goes to the Chelsea Synagogue, actually. Did he meet you there uh, by any chance? <laughs> you used to go to Chelsea, right? Yeah, who, did you, who do you remember from there? There last year, just to see really? Yeah. How's it going? It's going, yeah. So that is the basic idea, and then his next step after becoming more Jewish and understanding what Judaism is and having wonderful meals with Elma and the rabbi, and then he wants to know more about his ancestors, Uvos de Oro, in Sacramentos, Sacra, what am I talking about, in Sacramontes, sorry, I'm thinking of Sacramento for some reason, Sacramontes, which means holy, holy mountains, Sacramontes, and this is a little village in Portugal where all these people had their ancestries from, and they're still pretending to be Christians, but they're crypto-Jews in secret. But they know nothing about Israel. So the book is moving slowly towards Israel. And now we find uh, Cedric. Cedric goes to the internet now. We all would like to go to the internet and looks up Uvos de Oro. And what does he discover? That there was a man in the 16th century a, uh, a Jew who was caught by the Inquisition and put on the stake. And that name, man was, name was Umberto Uvos de Oro. Golden eggs again. So what's the connection with 21st century Cedric? This has to come out somewhere in the book. So Cedric goes to his parents and talks to them about it and tries to get them interested in Judaism. He even takes them a mezuzah to put on their door. And they say, no, we are too much involved with Christianity. We cannot possibly return to our Jewish roots. So this is very disappointing for him. Suddenly there is a phone call. And who is the phone from? A phone from a distant place by a man calling himself Umberto Uvos de Oro after looking up in the internet and he's speaking from on the auto de fe where he's about to be burnt by the Inquisition and so he says my dear Cedric I understand that you are one of us that you have laid real golden eggs, he says, from the, from the pyre before they set it alight. And I want you, my dear friend, Cedric, to take upon yourself a mission. I want you to go to Sacramentos, Sacramentos, and I want you to bring, to bring those, I give you a mission, to bring those poor villagers to the land of Israel 
uh, how on earth could Cedric, who has just learned about his Judaism, you know, how could he possibly do such a thing? So then he hears that there is an organization in England called the British Israelites. You may have heard of that. Did you hear of that, uh, Adrian, Abraham? The British Israelites are going to have a talk. The rabbi tells him, the rabbi of Chelsea Synagogue tells him, you're going to have a talk. You're going to have a talk by Professor Michelson. Professor Michelson is going to talk about his organization, Save, Save Sion, saving the people of Israel all over the world. And uh, Cedric goes to the talk and he meets Professor Michelson. And then Professor Michelson hears the story about Sacramentus from Cedric. Cedric said, I am determined to go there and to meet the people and to bring them to Israel. <coughs> yes. And Michelson says, my dear young man, well, he wasn't so young, he was 43 and six months. He said, my dear Cedric, I am going to help you to bring, to save those people and bring them to Israel. And this is fact, is what happens. So Cedric now travels to, he, he promises to the man on the pyre, he promises him, I will do the mission. I will, I promise you, Umberto, and as he says, I promise, the flames begin to lick the pyre and poor Umberto goes finally to his resting place in heaven. And this leaves Cedric with his mission. So Cedric now goes, prepares to go and uh, he makes the promise and then he tells uh, Michelson about it and then then he's on the plane and on the plane he's sitting next to a lovely young lady well maybe not so young as Cedric tucked into his kosher packed lunch on board the Portugal Airlines 0007 flight to Lisbon, he could not help noticing. On the seat next to him was also a rave striking raven haired young woman eating a kosher dinner. And that they were apparently the only two who had ordered glad kosher meals for the flight. So Cedric Jacob, Cedric, now he calls himself. Cedric Jacob, his new name. This seemed a good omen, yet another of the many strange and wonderful coincidences seemed to be attending his mission. Excuse me, madame, I couldn't help noticing that we both ordered glatt kosher meals. Quite a coincidence, isn't it? The striking young woman paused and smiled. Strangely enough, Mr. Bates, Cedric Jacob Bates, he volunteered. Strangely enough, Mr. Bates, I was about to summon up the courage to ask you the same question. Are you Jewish? I most certainly am. I am. And you? Or do you just have a yen for kosher meals on Portugal airline flights? Well, yes, I'm Jewish too. And yes, I do prefer kosher meals. By the way, I'm Graciela Goldovsky. She had a very attractive smile, the most attractive, soft, inflected English. Goldovsky? That's a very unusual name, isn't it? queried Cedric Jacob. Yes, I suppose it is. It basically means gold eggs. Cecil almost, Cedric, sorry. Cecil, Cedric Jacob almost choked on his chicken leg, not through any defect in the chicken, but because of yet another unbelievable coincidence. 
Are you all right, Cedric Jacob? Graciella inquired solicitously, solicitly. Yes, oh yes, quite all right, thank you. It's just that the coincidence. What coincidence? Your name. What of it? It's just a name, little strange maybe. You see, it has something to do with me, something very personal, and more than that, it is so much like my ancestral surname. But you said your family name is Bates. I don't see the connection. True enough. That's the name my parents adopted when they arrived in England. Actually, Rabbi Cohen of Chelsea Synagogue told me that the Hebrew for egg is Beitza. So there's a connection. But what is incredible, Graciela, is that their real surname back in Portugal was Ovos de Oro, which means golden eggs. Truly an amazing coincidence, but surely nothing more. The world is full of strange and remarkable coincidences, reflected Graciela philosophically. Cedric Jacob, the colour draining from his face, stared. I next you'll be telling me your parents, like mine, came from a little village called Sacramontes. Cedric, the colour drained from his face, stared at Graciela as if she were an apparition. That's exactly where they do come from. That's where I'm going. It was Graciela's turn. Graciela's turn to, to, to. Graciela's turn to be stunned. You mean you're going there too? What a remarkable coincidence. I'm beginning not to believe in coincidences anymore. I could ask you the same question. It's easy enough to answer. I'm going to do some genealogical research for my doctoral thesis, the Ovos de Oro, Crypto Jews of Sacramontes and the Legend of the Golden Eggs. What about you? Are you also working on doctorate? As a matter of fact, I am in a way, answered Cedric, with tongue in cheek. The return of the Crypto Jews of Sacramontes. The return from where? And what? And from to where? You mean to say you don't know the legend about Umberto Ovos de Oro? Mind you, Sir Graduela, I would give a lot to know such a person who laid golden eggs. Would you really query it, Cedric? Yes, I would, even though I would feel sorry for him having such a freakish disease. On the other hand, it would not be such a bad thing to know or even to be married to such a person. Fina financially speaking, I mean. What do you think, Cedric Jacob? Oh, I wouldn't worry your pretty head about it, said Cedric Jacob, endeavouring to keep a straight face. There's not even a chance in a million of such an eventuality. Although I must say, with your looks and intellect, you would make even a man who lays golden eggs very happy. And then they finish their kosher meals in silence. They change the subject. And when they emerged from the plane to catch the taxi to Sacramontes, they were holding hands. I leave you to guess what could have happened there. And now it was up to Cedric Jacob to successfully cement and finish his mission. So they go to Sacramontes, and then the people there are very dubious. Who are these two people suddenly appearing, disturbing our lives? And then, and then, Cedric gives the sign. This is what Amborta asked him, to give the sign. What is the sign that will change the minds of these poor people, centuries pretending to be Christians, Catholics, and just practicing Judaism in secret. What is the sign? What could there be? So the leader of the man who wants to put them in prison says, and it says to Cedric, one last request you have. And Cedric has one last request. I really want to go and clean myself in the municipal toilet. And he goes to the toilet and suddenly, 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 
from the confines of that antiquated municipal toilet, there rang out the mightiest, most alarming, most awesome triple clang ever heard in Sacramontes in Portugal, or I dare say in Europe and the rest of the world. It was a sound that shook the entire village as one man. And Cedric raised the gold egg up on high. And this was the sign that they had waiting for for centuries. Dear brothers and sisters of Oste Oro, I come to deliver you, all of you without exception, from centuries of denial of who you really are. Jews just like me and Graciela and our dear parents Sam and Martha, Max and Miriam. And here's a sign we will be waiting for, the golden eggs. Entrusted to me a mission by Dom Umberto Oberste Oro, who perished heroically, heroically on the Auto da Fe, who just a short while ago contacted me across the centuries, spoke to me and made me promise that I would come to Sacramontes and bring you all back to your ancestors. And suddenly they hear in the air a, my, a sound of aeroplanes, just suddenly in that remote village. And who are the aeroplanes from? They are in the best tradition of the Israeli Air Force, which has arrived, thanks to Professor Michelson and they landed one by one, and the assembled people of Sacramentos gazed in awe at the remarkable man who had delivered a speech in perfect Portuguese. Cedric spoke perfect Portuguese. Sir Graciela was as awed as the rest by his Cedric's inexhaustible fund of wonders. But Cedric, how did you know exactly, exactly when to come? My sweet Graciela, I simply sent Professor Michelson, a code singer signal to set Operation Umberto in motion while I was still at the municipal toilet. And then Professor Michelson, Michelson came, and as they turned out, they were busy shepherding the, all the villagers, from the oldest to the youngest, onto the Israeli Air Force planes, which took off and took them to the land of Israel. Uh, and Cedric turned at this stage to Graciela. Oh, by the way, Graciela, dear, in all the excitement, I almost forgot to ask you, will you marry me? Why did you ask if you already knew the answer? She replied mischievously. Dear reader, do not for a moment think that we have forgotten you or that we no longer value your comments and suggestions. You are surely as relieved and overjoyed as we are that he fulfilled his mission so successfully. And now comes the egglog, that is the epilogue. People often ask me what happened <coughs> to Cedric, Jacob and Graciela after that momentous day in Sacramentos, Sacramentos, Sacramentos. Well, they got married as uh, a, a, a Graciela's father, Max, the taxi driver, had correctly surmised in the Chelsea synagogue with Elmer Gold as best man and the wedding service, service was officiated by Rabbi Cohen. Fred da Vinci was also invited, of course, because he, he had given the check and the reception and Cedric Jacob promised to give him more for Berger eggs from his collection to sell at the forthcoming auctions in the new Da Vinci auction rooms in New York and Beijing, on condition that the bulk of the proceeds were donated to deserving charities. Cedric never did discover the actual medical cause of his unique disability, but he had a suspicion it might be partly due to the British habit of excessive tea drinking, in which he had heavily indulged during his lifetime. This could explain the golden color and texture of the eggs, although not their metallic property. The strange fact was, and yes. a little to his relief as a married man, that after that stupendous triple clang in Sacramentis, there was no recurrence of the phenomenon. He was, to all intents and purposes, quite normal again in his bowel movements. Yes. And best of all, 
his secret, La Briut, was safe with him for always. And Graciela took over the egg production after that and produced several remarkable young children for Sam and Miriam in her, Martha in the old age. In Israel, oh. Cedric Jacob Hebraized his name to Betsit Zahav, meaning golden eggs or Uvosh de Oro. In addition to his many philanthropic activities, Cedric Jacob spent much time with Professor Michelson and the Savage Israel team in helping the Sacramentis villagers settle down happily in their new lives in Israel, where after several months of study of Judaism and learning Hebrew, they all underwent a reconversion procedure so effectively to rid them of the last vestiges of their crypto-Judaism. As for the abandoned village of Sacramentis, it seems to have totally vanished off the face of Portugal, almost as if it had never existed. Oh, but it did exist in the pages of this book. Wow. I think I think it's an amazing story, but that's my that's my impression. But you see, this is the sum the sum total of many years of reading literature, being influenced by French, Spanish, British. Shakespeare, and this is what led me to write this book. And now I'm working on a new one, which should be even a bigger, a bigger, have a bigger impact yeah. about the English language. I thought you'd like to know. So I think now I'm going to have a drink. Are there any questions at this stage, ladies and gentlemen? Yes. L'chaim, <coughs> l'chaim, l'chaim, l'chaim. First of all, you really read very well uh, your story. Um, how do you write? I mean, you had, you had a bit, how did this happen? You had an idea from some place. Yeah, you had yeah. an idea. How did you, did, I, did you uh, write in one stream of consciousness? Or did you make corrections? No. How, what was the dynamics no, of producing this? The dynamics was to have the basic idea of a human being being capable of this, and then to take it from my knowledge of what's happening in the world between, uh, for, for example, the Jews, the crypto-Jews, because I, I've had a lot of experience of that, and to insert it into the story, to build up the story from that. First of all, you have a very poor man. How is he going to get rich? Obviously, if, some, if the gold is real, then it can be sold. And they take it all as real for Berger, which of course it isn't. So I want you to understand, this is not a real, I want you to understand, this is not a real life story. This is a fiction. So when you take the book, don't look at it as, as real life, right? It hasn't happened. I mean, it, it could happen to some of us. As I wrote in the beginning, here's a story that's hard to believe about a very ordinary Englishman named Cedric Bates, who won fame and glory by becoming the first man in history to lay golden eggs, and from near poverty suddenly became very rich. The egg problem, of course, changed his life completely, with all sorts of unexpected results. It's all recorded and written down in this novel I'm going to read. Take my word for it. Every word is true. And if you don't believe these amazing events, well, dear friends, it's up to you. So listen now what I'm going to tell here tonight for the very first time in Israel. And please try not to laugh, because it's not funny at all. It could happen to me or you. Yeah, and now I'm encouraging going encouraging words. But, uh, let me ask you one more time. Sure, <coughs> sure, basically. sure. You basically had, a bit, you had some basic ideas. Look, I... No, I no, let, let me ask you, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Did you think this story through from beginning to the end when people, when I mean, you sat down to write? Or some of the details emerge as no, you I think, did you I make corrections? I build or you wrote out. without corrections from beginning no, to end? No, not at all. What is, no. it, what is the style of your writing? The style is I, I, I have a basic idea, <clears throat> and then I build it up and try and think of different combinations and insert different parts of my experience, and then change and, and uh, take out parts. 
So he went back and did some editing. It's a whole, it's a whole procedure of writing. It's not, it's not a stream of consciousness. I, I haven't had, I haven't got that talent. So you're not like Mozart. What? Because Mozart. No, I'm that more like. Uh, Mozart said. Uh, no, I'm more like. Be I'm more like Beethoven. More like Beethoven. More like Dickens. <laughs> Dickens did a lot of correction. Yeah, but it, it means a lot of changes go in, and things are taken out and added. And uh, for example, my, my knowledge of uh, crypto jewelry, I have a fair amount of knowledge. So I wanted to put that in, and this was an ideal opportunity. Also, Portugal, the, the Portuguese language, the Spanish language. All these came from my experience. Huh? What? I see that you wrote another book or something. What is what is Sabra Man? Sabra Man is the first ever Israeli superhero. And this... You, you read about him? What? Did you read about him? No, I never read about him, but I was, a f I was influenced by all the things that are happening in the world of cinema. Oh, so you made it up? This is your idea? Absolutely. Really? Absolutely. My idea, but the drawings, the wonderful drawings here, are by a young man I discovered, I think I told Les earlier. You did. Called yeah. Uri Fink, who today is the number one comic book illustrator and cartoonist in Israel. I discovered him at the age of 15 when he began to work on these beautiful drawings. And that's why we have the book. And uh, I, want, I want this to be a film. So what, what is this about, this Sabra Man? What, what's Sab happening there? Sabra Man is a nice Jewish guy who suddenly gets tremendous powers because of an explosion. That's the story. And then he has the faith of Abraham and he walks around with a mug and David so you can reckon he has a kippah almost, you see. So he's almost like a Jew, you see. But he's a he is a super Jew. You heard it. You know what super Jews are. Well, what is a super Jew? Well, super Jews, like uh, many Israeli uh, Israelis, you know, many Israeli uh, Knesset members, you know. But he's not a Knesset member, <clears throat> and he has adventures. Uh, he fights against the anti-Semites, against Mengele in Hebrew and English. We produce comic books in Hebrew. This is a sort of summary of some of the adventures. When I was the publisher, I produced that. And I still have strong hopes. I very much want this to be a film. And uh, that is uh, more or less what I can tell you. But now I'm going to break the monotony, so to speak, and give you a couple of songs because I have my guitar with me. Oh. I promised. I promised. What? Uri Kadori. Uri Kadori. Uri, no, I, I don't. I haven't got the song with me. Sorry. <laughs> I know you like that one. Why didn't you write a song about Cedric and about Sabraman? Sabraman is a song. Sabraman, I have. I have a song about. Yeah, you really have a song about Sabraman? Oh, oh yeah, yes. You're kidding. I uh, know. I'm not kidding. You're kidding. <laughs> Here, here's a song about Sabraman. You want to hear it? That's amazing. Okay, but I think that's a coincidence, right? Yes, but I think since we're coming up to Purim, we should have a song about Purim. So I'm going to sing you a song about Purim, about Malkat Esther. Mele Faras Chipe Sisha, who besok who matzavota. Vihi haita Yehudiya, Uma Uma Haya Shema. Esther, Esther, Malkat Yisrael. Esther, Esther, Malkat Yisrael. Ko Yafa, Ko Gibor. Yada Shehaman Rasha, Shehama Yudi Besakana, who rats my hell, who dear Lamaka, who ma, who ma, Hayan Shema, Esther, Esther, Uh, 
abbreviated version. Wonderful. You really wrote a song about Sabram and... Uh, yes, of course, of course. Can you sing that? You know the song? What? No, I, don't, I never heard about it. Who wrote, who wrote about it? Oh, so you I mean the song? Sing it. Yeah, 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 why not? Maybe. When danger threatens our evil is nigh, just lift up your head and look up to the sky. And if you're lucky, then he'll fly by. So call his name, call his name, call his name. Severman. Oh, Severman. Oh, Severman. Yes, he can. Oh, yes. The courage of the Sabra, the power of Superman, the Israeli superhero with the faith of Abraham. Sabra man, yes he can. When danger threatens or evil is nigh, just lift up your head and look up to the sky. And if you're lucky, then he'll fly by. So call his name, call his name. Calling everybody now, Sabraman, oh, Sabraman, oh, Sabraman, yes, he can. Wonderful. Now, I want to do one a uh, song that I wrote about President Trump. I think you might have seen it. It's called Let's Do the Trump. Les, you may remember Yes. That. It features prominently. One, two, three, and Trump. Come on, everybody, let's do the Trump. Up in the air and down with a bump. Come on, everybody, let's do the Trump. <laughs> One, two, three, and Trump. Come on, everybody. About. Come on, everybody, let's do the Trump. Some people Trump low, some people Trump high. Some people try to reach the sky and Trump, 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 Trump. Everybody do the Trump. I asked my brother, what shall I do? Just watch your mother, she's Trumping too. Everybody, let's do the Trump Up in the air and down with a pump Come on everybody, let's do the Trump It's a very good video, goes with that Wonderful. song You've Wonderful. probably seen the video Les, I think you've seen it, right? It's on our YouTube, and it, it features very promptly okay. what, what about the rescuers? What? You know that song, the rescuers? Well, I, I didn't prepare one now I, I just prepared a, a, a little, yeah <coughs> okay. Can okay. we sing your Wallenberg song? Downloads? What? No, so I don't have them with me because I have to, I, I can't remember all the words. There is a man. So I'm going to sing another song. I'll try and remember it. Okay. I'm going to sing another song uh, here for the English teachers of Israel. I wrote a song called A Hymn, a th an anthem, a theme song called English is Easy. Now some of you come from that neck of the woods, English speakers. English is easy, A, B, C. English is easy, one, two, three. English is easy, so speak like me. English is easy, have a cup of tea. English is easy. When you're in England, say, how are you? When you're in England, say, please and thank you. So start to speak English, red, white, and blue. But don't you forget how to speak Hebrew. English is easy, A, B, C. English is easy, one, two, three. English is easy, so speak like me. English is easy, 
another cup of tea. And now I'm going to sing you a song which I wrote to honor my dear mother, Zikonali <coughs> Bracha. I think, Adrian, you may remember my mother. She's a very beautiful woman. Thank you very much. She was. And the song is called Yiddish Mama Mine. My Yiddish Mama, my Yiddish Mama, my Yiddish Mama, my my Yiddish Mama, 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 she loves me. She holds me, she guides me, she scolds me, with her warmth she enfolds me, my Yiddish mama man. And when times are hard and nothing's going right, she comforts me with wisdom and guides me with her life. And when I'm all alone, she's always standing there. With a mother's sweet embrace and a look that says I care. My Yiddish mama, my Yiddish mama, my Yiddish mama, mama. Now the years have passed away, taken her away. In my heart of hearts, still I hear her say, Son, I'm always with you, come what may. Just remember, a Yiddish mama. Never goes away. My Yiddish mama, my Yiddish mama, my Yiddish mama, my. Thank you, thank you very much. Now I want to sing a song. I'm sorry I won't take your time. You're coming towards the end. It's called Let's Go Away. Let's Go. Huh? No, 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 no. No. Uh, let's go to Jerusalem. Let's go to Jerusalem. Let's go to Jerusalem. For the time has come. Let's go to Jerusalem. Let's go to Jerusalem. Let's go to Jerusalem, for the time has come. It's time for peace and all mankind. Time to find one and more at the line. So listen to the Lord, Lord above. Let's go, let's go, let's go. The time has come. Let me take you by the hand to the promised land. Let me take you by the hand to the promised land. Let me take you by the hand to the promised land. For the time has come. Let's run to Jerusalem. Let's walk to Jerusalem. Let's fly to Jerusalem. For the time has come. Yeah. I'm going to finish now with a song that some people might have heard before called Jerusalem Rock. Jerusalem Rock, Jerusalem Roll. I got Jerusalem in my soul. Jerusalem One. Jerusalem home, I got Jerusalem in my soul. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, city of gold, city of light, city to be home money noon or night, city of love, yes, city of peace. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Everybody now, Jerusalem rock, Jerusalem roll. I got Jerusalem in my soul. Jerusalem one, Jerusalem home. 
I got Yerushalayim Banishmati. Thank you. Kodaraba. So then. Thank you. On, on behalf of uh, the Roots and Branch and uh, all of us here this evening, David, the title of your talk was, and your presentation was, The Secret Life of a... Um, no, the Secret World. The Secret World. I told you, the Secret World of Cedric, the Secret World of his parents. <laughs> well, it's no more a secret. Our no, singing no. novelist is uh, Na Kamate. you all welcome to continue uh, watching David's uh, music and reading his books and we want to thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Really, thank you David and we really appreciate it and we wish you all Hatzlacha, all the luck and the muzzle and the brocha for your future. Endeavors. Thank you so much Les, I really appreciate all your help, Larry's help and Lowell's help. And give my best wishes to you all and don't forget to take a book on the way. Kodesh Tov to you all and thank you all for coming.